Okay, so once again, my name is Mariah Weika with the Associated Colleges of the Midwest, and we'd like to invite you all to an informational session and a brief topical lecture about the ACM Florence program with Dr. Sarah Cross from Ripon College. Um, Sarah, thanks for being here today. We're excited to spend some time learning a little bit about the type of interdisciplinary topic that students may learn about when they go on the Florence program. Um, and so, and just, just once again, we'll have time for questions and answers about the program, about um, Dr. Cross's lecture, anything like that after, after this brief topical lecture. Um, so without further ado, Sarah, thank you so much for being here today, and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Mariah, and thanks for uh, inviting me to participate in this. Um, I haven't done it much before, so I hope this works. Uh, it's, it's dark here in Florence, um, and uh, we've had several weeks of classes now, and I'm, I'm so excited about the courses that I'm teaching. Uh, this is one, Music and Art, Hearing the Story in Florentine Art, 1350 to 1700. The other class I'm teaching right now is uh, Music and Patronage and Politics and History um, in Florence, and uh, that's an interesting course as well. But these are just examples of the kinds of courses that you can take when you're here. The visiting faculty offers courses in their, uh, their specialties, and mine happens to be music. So, I've got a small lecture here, we'll just go on, and this is what I used to introduce the course to the students. Now, we have students from many different dis disciplines here. There are some art history majors, there's also classics, there's an anthropology major, um, uh, and so it's in a, a variety. So, these courses are really uh, general and appeal to a wider audience. So, to start, um, the rationale, why teach a music and art class. Um, these are some of the points that I think are important. Music and the visual arts from the same cultural era reflect and comment on society. Well, you know, art of any sort is a product of a culture and gives us some information about it. And um, so by only studying one of those, I don't think you get the same uh, kind of rounded experiences if you look at more than one. And music and art really seem to go together. Um, and I'll get back to that theme a little, little, in a little bit. The idea that hearing and sight are two primary senses um, were, that was a common uh, idea in the Renaissance. And in fact, Leonardo da Vinci wrote a treatise. He tried very strenuously to say that sight was more important than hearing, but I don't know that he convinced anyone. Um, but this is a topic that people at the time discussed, and so we're kind of going along with that. Um, Analyzing music and art is, um, I think, fun. I enjoy it, and uh, the students seem to as well. But it also provides another narrative to the kind of history that you generally learn, which is military and political history, I guess, maybe economic history. But music and art touch on those things as well. And so this is another way of creating a narrative for, for the past. Also, music and art share many technical descriptors. For example, uh, I pulled some terms out that are part of the vocabulary, both disciplines, and you can see that there's a lot of correlation, although they don't always mean the same thing in each, uh, each area. But certainly line, shape, talking about color, whether it, in music it would be the, the, the kinds of instruments that you're hearing generally and what range they're playing in. In art, of course, color can be all kinds of things. It can be hue, it can be uh, pure color, it can be dark, and, and so forth. But so these are all terms that we use in the class when we're looking at examples of art and listening to examples of music. Now it's interesting that, of course, in this era, and, and even now, there are many artists who are also musicians. This is a further argument for combining these two disciplines. The woman who's sitting at the keyboard here is, uh, was a 16th century artist named Lavinia Fontana. She was active in Bologna, and she had many commissions from wealthy women, particularly, to paint portraits. This is a self-portrait that she made, um, probably for her future husband, but she shows herself as a cultured woman of the time, sitting at a keyboard, because this is humanism coming into play here. Uh, people in the Renaissance, with any kind of income and education level, were expected to know how to play an instrument, and the keyboard instrument was a, a very common one. She's done a very good job, a meticulous job, of painting the keyboard and her hand position. And you notice, though, in the back, there's the easel, so she's also reminding you that she's a music, an artist. Um, and very 
clearly uh, confident and uh, knows her own self-worth. So this is a person we will be talking about more in the class. Of course, the man on the left, on the other side, on the right, is Leonardo da Vinci, um, who is mostly, of course, thought of as an artist. However, even though he thought sight was better than hearing, he was himself a talented musician. He played the viola, uh, viola de braccia, which was a kind of Renaissance vi viola, and um, he and Lorenzo de Medici, his friend, used to compose verses and play uh, these instruments, and, and the, the poetry was extemporized. So unfortunately, we don't have any examples of what he uh, wrote, but he was had a reputation for being a very skillful player and singer, as well as an artist, a scientist, and everything else. So many, a lot of overlap there. Some of the uses of music and art are, of course, religious, and especially when you're talking about 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, there are just so many religious paintings. There were altar pieces made for churches and devotional images made for uh, convents and, and monasteries and even for private homes. This particular picture is um, a very common theme in, in all the paintings from these eras, which is the coronation of the Virgin. So Mary has ascended to heaven. She's being crowned by Jesus. And surrounding her, and all of them, I should say, are uh, clergy. You can see by some of the pointy hats, um, martyrs and saints, all of them in heaven, and angels who are playing musical instruments. And this is a very common uh, genre in, in art from this period. So we look at this in the class and say, well, what are the instruments that the angels are playing? The little one on the, with the red cloak at the bottom is playing a small portable organ, and uh, the, with the one on the right is playing a large fiddle. And at the very top, if you might notice an angel playing a lute, and on the other side of the dove, an angel playing a harp. These are all instruments that were not only in use at the time, but they symbolized uh, not only rejoicing and the beauty of, of sound in heaven, but also divine harmony. And as stringed instruments, they're tuned. Um, it gets very complicated, but it fits in with medieval theory about the harmony of the spheres. And so music in this case is giving us an important message that we might not have otherwise. Another use of music, of course, is, is in portraits. And this lovely young lady is probably from the 16th century. Um, she's very much absorbed in her music. And uh, so we talk about portraiture as a kind of self-fashioning, maybe the, the Renaissance equivalent of a selfie. How do you want people to see you? What kind of image do you want to project? In this case, um, she's playing a lute, and this very beautiful painting is emphasizing her, her status because her dress is luxurious, and she's got, um, there's a, an urn sitting on the windowsill, and the table on which her music is placed is very beautifully embroidered. So in this sense, she's a member of the upper middle class, probably, who, again, uh, for humanistic reasons, has learned to play an instrument. And in her case, because she's probably not married, this makes her desirable as a spouse, especially for a professional or learned man who needs to have um, a, a wife who is accomplished and can entertain. Um, so a lot of messages there in this painting, and it's not uncommon to find women especially playing the lute or others or singing or other types of things. Now, this is a little bit more grim, um, but it's a genre known as memento mori. We've talked about this in our class, too. It's very common. The skull at the very center is what sends the main message here, that life is temporary, and it's a reminder that you, the viewer, will die and uh, to make the most of the life that you have. Why the musical instruments? You can see a trombone in the foreground, and in the back, there's an overturned lute. I think the thing here is that music is a temporal uh, item. It exists in time, but not space. So time is the theme. Time passing uh, is, is the, mo the uh, main idea here. And sometimes you can even see hidden just, to the, just behind the skull, there's an hourglass. And that's another uh, indicator, of course, of the passing of time. So music is associated here with uh, the earthly kinds of activities that we have and also that it only, once the instrument stops, the time is done. So allegory is another thing. These are, this is a favorite topic, and we've spent time on this in class. 
here we have a nice group of very well-fed and prosperous Dutch people, a family from the 16th century or 17th century. And um, looks like the, the, the husband is about to sing. His wife is the one playing the smaller instrument, maybe a, a, a kind of mandolin. And then there's a very serious looking lute player and a bass player. So you have a number of very beautifully painted instruments here that would have been used at the time. And you have different members of the family in multi-generations. And you notice in the back there are portraits of probably the grandparents who are deceased. That's why they're paintings and, and not real people. So the idea here is that this is something that people did for pleasure in the 17th century. They would entertain themselves in the course of an evening by playing and singing in a family group. There's another message here too that they wanted to send, which is that this is a family where harmony reigns. These people all get along. There's, it's a harmonious group of people. So again, message it might not be so obvious right away. Now, it wasn't just the, uh, the upper middle class and the elites who could enjoy these activities. Here's another group. Uh, this is, these are peasants from a village wedding in Flanders. This is a painting by Bruegel. And uh, it's, it's quite busy. And you can see the bagpipe player in the front who looks like he's being uh, persuaded to take a break and have a little bit of something to drink by the fellow on his right. But this also points up, so it points up two things. One, that music was a social activity at every level of society. And second, that music also was very, very much used for dancing because these people, I think, are dancing a well, very vigorous kind of uh, couples dance. Now there's also uh, a narrative function of music. We've talked about that. This is an ancient uh, uh, Roman or a Greek frieze, probably from a wall, which uh, shows a couple of things. Because it goes from left to right, it looks like a group of people moving. The woman in front beating a drum with her head thrown back, which is a pose that indicates she was singing. And then the man behind her is playing a double reed instrument, which in ancient Greece would have been called the aulos, the ancestor of the oboe. It's a raucous instrument. You, you, you know what a one oboe sounds like. If you multiply that by two, you get twice the sound and twice the, the raucousness. And he's got an animal skin draped over his shoulder, the person behind another one. Um, so this is uh, some kind of activity. It might be a festival of Dionysus. Uh, it could be, these could be Bacantes or, or Maenads who are unfortunately known for tearing up human beings. But at any rate, it's a very loud kind of outdoor procession and we know just from the activity that it's some music was accompanying some kind of action, celebrating something perhaps, uh, but at, at any rate that it was a festive kind of activity. So that's a very quick overview um, of some of the topics that role that the music has and why I think it's important to have a music in art class. I wanted to mention just um, some of the themes that we have covered in this class. Uh, it's kind of a, a weekly theme. Uh, we started out looking at Gregorian chant and then um, a medieval uh, building in Florence, the Orsan Michele, which was a grain market and then became a church. And we talked about the multi-sensory experience of music in worship. Uh, in the Renaissance, Middle Ages and Renaissance. And as part of that, one of our site visits was to attend a mass at the Duomo, the cathedral here in Florence, because uh, in the time period we've been studying, music was just a part of their sensory world. You know, when you were sitting in church, you would hear music, you would hear a choir, and perhaps an organ. You can look around and see religious images, devotional images at the altar and, and other places and chapels. You would see candles lit. You would smell incense when the priest uh, moved the censer around the altar. So the whole uh, picture involves many different senses. And going to a mass here, I think, really brought that point home to the students because they realized that uh, they realized the role of music and, and how music and art together uh, produced a certain kind of experience for people. It still does. Um, another thing was uh, a religious theme in art is, is uh, the Annunciation. And um, this is very, very common. They've seen so many pictures of the Annunciation, of the angel Gabriel coming to tell Mary that she's going to bear a son. 
the, uh, that's only half the equation though, because what the pictures can't tell you is what Mary actually responded. Uh, she's pictured in varying poses. Once she got over the shock, she apparently said, sang a song, which is recorded in the Bible, uh, known as the Magnificat. And so that text, that song, has been sent by many composers, and we listened, we looked at pictures of the Annunciation, then we listened to some of the settings of the Magnificat, which begins with her, in her words, uh, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, and goes on from there. So uh, we moved forward a little bit into the present, because I'm trying to connect past and present. We listened to music by Vivaldi, by Bach, and then by John Rutter, who's a contemporary English composer. Um, we also looked at mythology, uh, the Orpheus myth. There's many, many portrayals of Orpheus in art, and then listened to the first significant opera in six, from 1607 by Monteverdi, which was the setting of the Orpheus story. So it's been really fun to make these connections. The students uh, have been very um, energetic and, and full of ideas and communicating things, and that's made it a great experience for me. So I think my time's probably up, isn't it, Mariah, for talking? Hi there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. All right. Well, thank, okay. you. thank you for that. And it looks like we have just a few questions. So okay. we seem to be a little bit more um, like program focused in terms uh -huh. of of the semester program. And so the first question is, um, what's the benefit of a false, like a full semester in Florence versus a short-term program? Ah, that's a loaded question. We've talked about that a lot here. And I would say that if you're here for a whole semester, you get a fully immersive experience, which you, you just simply can't do in two weeks or three weeks. Um, because here in Florence, you live with an Italian family. That's your homestay. You get breakfast with them. You eat your evening meals with them. Many of them don't really speak English. So you use the Italian that you learn in the Italian classes to communicate. And you learn about the culture from the inside. And that's something that's very hard to do. If you, a place like Florence is so full of tourists, there are millions and millions of people who come to visit every year. You could easily spend two or three weeks here without ever speaking Italian or ever um, actually interacting with Italians. And, and so while it's important, and even on a short-term visit, you can, of course, visit the monuments, you can see art, you can, can look at the beautiful scenery, but you don't have time to really process things and, and get into the culture and, and maybe go to a music festival or um, an art opening or even just a family dinner. Uh, people, the students have had all kinds of experiences like that. And the early days, I know a couple of them told me that their families had farms in the country. So they went there and they were harvesting figs. And they spent a Sunday afternoon in the country with the grandmother. And I mean, those are things that, that are really special and that you, you can't do if you're only here for a short time. Right, right, absolutely. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Another another student said, um, is this program just suitable for art history students? Oh, no, no, no. Um, there are, I don't exactly know how many of the students right here right now are art history majors, but I would say only maybe three or four. The rest come from everywhere else. And uh, all the classes are aimed at people who are, are not specialists. Um, uh, Jody Mariotti, of course, who's the director, is an art historian, uh, but, but I'm not, and uh, other people who visit come from other disciplines as well. So you do talk a lot about art, you look at a lot of art, but the, you do other things as well, and it's all within the context of an interdisciplinary kind of structure and very much with the idea of the liberal arts. Mm -hmm. So um, you can, and, and there are research opportunities and so on. Um, so I would say, no, don't worry about not being an art history major. Okay. And a, a question along along similar lines is, um, I don't speak Italian. Can I still be successful studying in Florence? Yes, you can. <laughs> because 
I, I've been here, this is my second stint here, and uh, I took Italian when I came. I didn't speak it the first time I came. Uh, I still am not fluent by any means, and probably never will be, but even just starting out with a little bit, you, you, when you come, you, you get a whole month of nothing but Italian classes. The whole month of September is Italian. You have it five days a week for three hours at a time, and then you go home and your family helps you and you practice. So by the time you start your other classes in October, you're already past the really beginning level, and you can go out, you can order food, you can ask directions, um, you can at least, you go to a shop and say, buongiorno, and you know, basic stuff like that. Um, and then it really, you just have to keep using it and you get more confident. But, but really many, many people here do speak English. It's not like you're totally at sea and you have to rely on your Italian only. Right, right. All right, fantastic. Um, it looks like we have just a couple more questions. Um, mm -hmm. One of them is, uh, what's your favorite part about living in Florence? Oh, wow. <laughs> well, the food has to be right up near the top. Um, <laughs> um, I, I really love all everything. I love the fact that this is a city you can walk around and through. Uh, it's it's definitely a walking city. Uh, all the Italians that I've met are, have just been delightful. They're they're very warm, they're very receptive. They they encourage you to speak Italian. They don't criticize you or laugh at you if you get the wrong verb tense or something. Um, it and it's just it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, I really enjoy. It's also safe. I mean, the, the central city. People are out at night. They walk around with children. Um, one of my favorite things is actually to go for a walk, walk in the evening and, and walk down some of those old medieval streets in the center of the city. Um, there's just always something to see, and um, it's a very vital, very vibrant culture here. Right, right. Fantastic. Uh, as somebody who's been to Florence a couple of times, I would agree with all of that. <laughs> <laughs> and you want to come back, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly right. This whole, this whole webinar just makes me wish I were there. Um, I, was, I was just going to say one more thing. Um, you know, Italy is not a huge country, but it's very, every, these cities are very different. And because geographically you have the mountains down the middle, um, there's a character, each city has its own character. So Rome is very different from Florence, and, and Venice, of course, is very different. And then if you can take day trips, as, as many people do, to other places like Siena or Pisa, uh, we take the students to both of those places, actually. You really get a sense of, of Italian, a bigger sense of Italian culture than if you're just in one place. And that's another argument, I think, for, for doing a semester-long program. Right. Absolutely. Okay. And then it looks like the last question we have here is, what are examples of class site visits that have been students' favorites? Hmm. Well, I don't know about uh, the art classes. For me, we just went yesterday to uh, the Church of Santa Felicita, which is one of the oldest uh, parishes in Florence, and were able to hear and actually play a 16th century organ. Wow. That's there. And uh, it, was <laughs> it was quite cool and quite shocking to the students that something that old is still functioning. It's been restored, of course, but that was actually like a hands-on kind of site visit that I think they really enjoyed. Um, later this semester we're going to go to a workshop that restores uh, 18th century pianos. And there is a class being offered right now on restoration and so some of the students already kind of have the idea, they, they're working on art, but this will be music instruments and so they'll be able to hear and maybe even play uh, some restored 18th century pianos. Um, so I think I think those were those were pretty big. Yeah, um, that sounds fantastic. Yeah, we have another question. Favorite gelato? <laughs> <laughs> oh God! You know what? I tried. I had the goal. My favorite. I have my favorite gelateria. It's uh, right across the Arno, and we took the students there the first night they came when they were so jet lagged they they could hardly walk straight. But the gelato <laughs> helped a lot. It just woke them right up. I would say one of my favorite flavors is pistachio. Or pistachio. Um, the fondante, dark chocolate, is also great. So is the strawberry, which is fragola. The cool thing is, 
at a gel, uh, when you go to get gelato, you can buy a small cup and you can get two different flavors so you can sample different things. Mm -hmm. that is, it's definitely worth a trip. It's a perk. <laughs> when I studied in Italy, that was one of the very first things I, I learned how to say in Italian was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> may I have a gelato, please? It's important. <laughs> it, it is important. It's a big, big thing. And when the weather was hot here, as it was through September and part of October, you could walk over at night and there would be long lines. I mean, there are many gelato places in Florence, but this is one that the locals recommend. And so we, we try to go there as often as we can. Well, fantastic. Um, let's see if we have any other questions. I'm just going to check the, the question pane. Um, let's see. One second. We answered the favorite gelato question. Don't ask me what my favorite pasta is. There's too many kinds. <laughs> um, oh, here's, here's one more. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about the ACM program site? So I think that's a question about, like, the... Uh, the website? Well, no, like... Um, if I am interpreting this right, they mean uh, like where they take classes? Oh, oh, the classroom, sure. Um, the ACM classes are in a building that's owned by a, a school called Lingua Viva, which is a language school. And they also, the, this, this school also teaches other non-ACM students. So they, there's a, a classroom that we use and a kind of work room that students can use that's reserved for ACM students. And then the office is there with Jody and Rosita, who's the program assistant. Um, but the other rooms are, are also used for other students who are from all over the world to learn Italian. And it's um, centrally located. It's fairly close to the train station, I guess. People tend to, and there's a refrigerator there. Um, it's not a huge space. Uh, it's what we've got, you know, and it's uh, in an old building. There's a really funky elevator that goes up. It's from 1929, and wow. that in itself is a cultural kind of icon. I'm, I'm very fond of this elevator. You can only have two people and one, two suitcases at the same time. <laughs> but, but I mean, it's, it's a, it's, it's not super modern. You know, we could. It would be nice to have more space, but this is what we have, and right. uh, I think the students really make the best of it. Right. They bring their things. And it's also very conveniently located to a grocery store where uh, students can go and buy their lunch because breakfast and supper are provided, but you're on your own for lunch and you generally you can bring something from home. You, you can go and buy a salad or a panino um, or yogurt or whatever you want at the store and then bring it back to the school and eat it. Right. Fantastic. Okay. Mm -hmm. And just a, um, you know, a reminder to any, any students who are considering the program who are tuned in with us. Oh, wait, one second. We have another question. Um, okay. How are, the, how are the host families chosen? Um, and is there, how many students per family are there? Uh, well, Jody Mariotti takes care of that. She's, some of these families have been uh, hosting students for over 20 years. So they, they, a lot of them have children of their own who are adults who have, who have moved out. Um, and so they kind of are on a roster, and, and Jody works with them. She knows them personally, and uh, she assigns the students generally most of the time in pairs. Uh, sometimes there are three students with a family. And uh, you get to choose, well, actually, I'm not sure about this. That, she tries, she tries to not put people from the same school together mm. so that you learn, you get to know other people, you know what I mean? Because that has caused some problems in the past. Um, but, but that kind of thing is all talked, she tick talks about that, explains that at the very beginning, right as soon as you arrive. Because basically what happens is you get here like on August 30th and you're here for a couple of days, you try to get over your jet lag, you stay in a hotel across the street from Lingua Viva. Uh, we take you for meals, and orient there's a lot of orientation. And then, like, on the third day that you're here, you go to stay with your families. And uh, I think she tries to match up compatible people, and she takes into account dietary needs and medical needs and all those things. 
So the people who are hosting the families are very experienced and what I've heard the students saying is that the food is fantastic. They love their host moms. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I mean, I'm not exaggerating. I hear they talk about it a lot. So it's been a good experience. I have I have not heard any complaints about anything like that. And from alumni that, that I speak to who have been on this program, um, the host families are hands down one of their favorite parts about studying yeah. Lawrence. Um, one of my favorite stories is one of our our alumni was talking about um, how his host mom loved opera, uh, mm -hmm. loved, loved, loved opera, and would talk about opera a lot and would try to tell him about it. And so he introduced her to uh, to YouTube. Uh, <laughs> and, oh, no. And her life was never the same, right? Oh, and she was just, like, completely delighted. Um, yeah. because she could find all of these incredible pieces of, of opera on YouTube, mm. they would watch it together and, and blast it at full full volume. So they're just fun, <laughs> fun cross-cultural moments like that, right? Or even cross-generational, right. right? Where this sort of elderly yeah. Italian woman discovered this whole new world through opera on YouTube. So um, I think those are the things yeah. that are like totally irreplaceable about living with a host family, for sure. Right, and that, that actually reminds me of another thing, is that all the host families have Wi-Fi. Uh, it's been a, it was a little problem a few years ago before things were really good, but but they've they they're set up so that you can do your homework in your home. You don't have to be at Lingo Beaver to use your computer. Right. Fantastic. Well, mm. I think that that answers all of the questions we have in our question pane. Um, and just a reminder that it's a fall program. The full semester program in Florence is a fall program. Um, and that any questions you have about the application process um, can be can be sent to us here at here at the ACM. Um, I will even put my my email address in the chat pane for those of you who <laughs> uh, are interested in sending questions my way. And uh, not to mention, I can follow up individually with any prospective students. And, and for those of you that are watching this recording, so not the live version of this webinar, we hope that you'll, uh, we hope that you'll send questions our way and, and hopefully that you'll end up in Florence. Um, and we hope that, that you enjoyed this today. I know that I did. I learned, I learned more. So thank you, <laughs> Dr. Cross, for joining us. And do you have anything else you would like to add? No, just... Come to Florence. You'll never regret it. <laughs> yep. It's a, it's a magical yep. place to be. So um, thanks again for your time and for taking a little bit out of your afternoon to, to, to learn about Florence with us today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cross, and we will talk to you soon, I'm sure. <laughs> sure. Ciao. Grazie mille. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>